podcast public service announcement. You're about to hear an episode in the middle of a multi-part show arc. If you haven't heard the previous episodes, we suggest you skip back to part one of this topic in the feed and listen in order. All right, Paranoid Strain Orchestra, hit it. As we kick off this, which is likely the longest of our secret society discussions... Wait, you just did an hour and 40 minutes on the goddamn Rosicrucians, and you think this is going to be longer than that? Yes. Yes, I do. And that's because, as interesting as I hope you'll all agree the Rosicrucian story was, their impact was predicated, for the most part, on their essential non-existence. And as for our other topics, the Priory was a real thing that had at most a couple of dozen members at any given time, and was only around in real life for a decade or so. The Cathars were almost completely wiped out by their opponents after a heyday of influence in a limited region of southern France that lasted maybe 150 years, but was only a big deal for half that time. The Templars are, among these groups, the one with the longest verifiable history, 1119 to 1307, or 1314 if you extend out to the Molay's immolation. Of course, these are the historically reliable dates. As we've discussed, many conspiracists claim wildly unsupportable periods for these societies' existence, from Plantard's thousand-year scion hoax to conspiracists' insistence that the Templars continue to be a vital force behind world events, not only for centuries beyond their dissolution, but all the way to the present. But in terms of historically verifiable tenure and influence across the world, all of the above pale in comparison to Freemasonry, which has existed in nearly its modern form for over three centuries. And as we'll shortly hear, many elements of the craft, which is both the term that many Masons use to refer to the group, and the title of a great, great history by Professor John Dickey, that we will rely on for as long as Jesuit plans to keep jabbering about this topic. Indeed, and many elements of the craft can be clearly extended back an additional century to the court of King James in Scotland in the 16-teens. So they've really, no shit, been around for 400 years, give or take. But their importance is more than just their longevity. Masons are also one of the key groups that all conspiracies boil down to, according to Jesuit's maxim of conspiracy underpinnings, trademark pending. That is, if you dig deeply enough into any conspiracy theory, the shadowy figures behind it are always either the Jews, the aliens, or the Illuminati. Oh, and the Illuminati is just a scarier word for Freemasonry. Well, it was when the Illuminati actually existed. More on that a bit later, but yeah, that's our educated opinion. Every single conspiracy theory, if you chase it down the rabbit hole long enough, has one of those shadowy groups at the bottom of it. For example, consider the following hypothetical conversations. The Earth is flat. But everything about reality tells us it's not. That's just because you believe the lies are feeding you, sheeple. Who is they? What are you, fucking stupid? It's the Jews, aliens, and our Illuminati slash Freemasons. Need another example? Okay. The COVID vaccine is poison made out of pureed human babies designed to neuter men, spontaneously abort the next generation in the womb, implant microchips to let us be tracked by Bill Gates, wire us for 5G, and remake our DNA to remove the God gene and turn everyone into atheists. Wait, what? Just read the script, unicorn. Those are all things people have actually said about COVID vaccines. Seriously? Fuck. Anyway, that shit I just said is totally true, and you know who's behind it? Bill Gates? Didn't you just mention him? No, you fucking sheep lip tarp moron. He's being secretly controlled. And you know who's doing the controlling? It's a- Jews, aliens, and our Illuminati slash Freemasons. Obviously. Give it a shot with the rest of the conspiracies we've covered. It's eerie how a quick search through the forums, sites, videos, and podcasts dedicated to these topics eventually lead to one or more of these three purported villains. Which brings me to the fact that, while I was working on this series, I happened upon a YouTube clip in which a caller to a British radio station... Jez? Ma'am? I think you're kind of whitewashing the actual facts here. Not to badger the witness, but this YouTube clip, as you put it, it was just a few minutes? Like a normal clip length? Not exactly. It was like 360-something minutes. Right. A six-hour-plus compilation of what exactly? Of James O'Brien, a smarty-pants talk radio host I think is clever, taking calls from pro-Brexiteers who have no idea what they're talking about. Six hours. Yes. Of that. Yes. The call-in question is about three hours in. And you were listening to this for work? 
No. The show? Not really. So you were listening for fun? Yeah, but I listened on double speed, so it was only like three hours or so. You have a problem. Look, if listening to people confidently and proudly present blithering nonsense is a crime, I'm going to be first up against the wall when the revolution comes. Also, O'Brien bats this woman around like a kitten with a ball of yarn. I love it so much. Now, we have a view in this country that we have a democracy, yeah. um, and everybody who says, well, hang on a minute, um, is considered a conspiracy theorist. You yourself brought up the, the World Trade Center debacle, but yet you haven't mentioned the, the third building that fell, oh, due to office fires. Okay. Now, that's quite interesting. I, I'm it? sure it is, uh, but I think we'll wait to find out just how interesting it is for another day, Catherine. J just, just to be clear, where do you think the rigging takes place? I believe that vote rigging takes place, yes. No, but where? How do they do have it? Have you heard of the Freemasons? Uh, no, what are they? You have never heard of the Freemasons? No. <laughs> well, I can't believe that you can be there talking with any degree of authority on conspiracy theory without any cognizance of, of Freemasons. Who, who are the Freemasons? Are they a band? The, the, the Freemasons are a secret society which inhabits... Oh, well, that's why I haven't heard of them. The of London. That's why I haven't I heard of them, because they're secret. Sorry? That's why I haven't heard of them, because they're so secret. No, they're really not that secret. You just said they were a secret society. Well, they can see their, their dealings. Their, their did, dealings they, did they do the third tower? Did, did they do the third tower? Sorry? Did they blow up the third tower? Well, I think that's a stupid question. Sorry. I absolutely refuse to dignify that. Fair enough. Did they kill Tupac? Who the hell is Tupac? <laughs> I can't believe you're having a conversation about conspiracy <laughs> theories and you're not no, cognizant of Tupac Shakur's assassination. Uh, well, I'm sorry, now you're starting to ridicule me, which is absolutely the way that people go. When I, they I know. See something when you claim that the Freemasons rigged the vote for the... Re I, I, Catherine, I'm, I'm afraid I'm going to make a stand on principle here and say it's not my fault that you're getting ridiculed. <laughs> Doing the Absolutely, but it's not my fault. This lady is a great example of how the Freemasons, like the Jews and the aliens, can suddenly emerge out of nowhere in the middle of a seemingly unrelated conspiracy theory discussion. Because, remembering the JMCU, nobody is going to adopt that acronym. One of them is behind abso fucking lutely everything. And so the Masons are not only the longest lasting secret society, but arguably the one that has the most important place in the minds of conspiracists. But on top of that, the craft has been incredibly influential in the real world. For example, nearly a third of all U.S. presidents have been Freemasons, 14 out of 46. Um, how many have been Knights Templar, Dana? I'm going to say, like, none? Probably none. Key wrecked. And we already covered the fact that the Masons were a big enough deal in the early days of the American Republic that there was a competitive national political party whose primary goal was reducing their influence on American political, civil, and economic life. But Masons have been at or near the top of not just politics, but a variety of fields for centuries, especially in the English-speaking world. And throughout that period, there have been plenty of reasons to think that the fraternity has influenced events behind the scenes for both good and bad. Think back to the beginning of this topic. Dr. Spence told us a story about the Russian Revolution, when a member of the despised and recently deposed ruling class called upon a communist official to give him safe passage, based on their shared identity as Masons. Remarkably, against all requirements of his political station, the Bolshevik let the royalists escape unscathed. This is precisely the sort of subtle influence that the existence of the Masons has verifiably had on world history. But of course, the very secrecy that animates the group has led stories like this to be inflated in the minds of conspiracists into a vision of all-powerful, secret Masonic manipulations that simply doesn't stand up to scrutiny. Conspiracy theorists have the Masons working behind the scenes to affect everything from local elections to the French Revolution. As we shall see soon. But it's not just the conspiracists who are muddying the waters here. The story is also complicated by the often obfuscatory and self-serving way the Masons have written, edited, and at times outright fabricated elements of their own history, stretching their story thousands of years back into the mists of time and taking credit for both heroism and oppression that doesn't really fit the historical facts. So let's get started with this monstrously huge topic. This time, let's get an understanding of what Freemasonry is today, and then we'll use that knowledge to inform our historical travels. I wish I was a mason in London City Grand Lodge master sitting pretty A symbol, a shape, passport protected A Bible and an apron to hide me erected Let's try this canoe and Tyler to get a rose of girl will marry you And you can live up high in the sky In the eye of a Freemasonry today is, by almost any measure, in significant decline from its high point in the previous century. 
and that high watermark for the Masons was, to a disproportionate degree, driven by the near ubiquity of the group in post-war America. In the early 1960s, it's estimated that one in 12 American men were involved in the Masons. Meaning that there were twice as many Masons in the United States at this time than in the rest of the world combined. But that only tells a small part of the story, because those American men who weren't involved in the Masons were more than likely members of one of the 235 other more or less secret societies that emerged to emulate the Masons between the end of the Civil War and the turn of the 20th century. These ranged from the <clears throat> improved order of red men. That sounds problematic. As well as the National Grange of the Order of the Patrons of Husbandry, the Benevolent and Protective Order of Elks, the Tribe of Ben-Hur, and plenty of others. In 1905, the Rotary Club was founded as a not particularly secret secret society. Basically masonry with all the secret society stuff removed, but all of the business networking and community improvement stuff retained. There were some others that might still sound familiar to you, including the aforementioned Elks, as well as the Odd Fellows so-called poor man's masonry, and a group to which Jesuit's beloved great-grandfather belonged. The Knights of Columbus, joined by Fearful's grandfather, basically masonry, but organized and administered by the Catholic Church. And TV reflected this obsession with membership of all kinds as well. Remember Fred Flintstone and Barney Rubble belonging to the Loyal Order of the Water Buffalo? But Fred and Barney were water buffaloes, mostly because they were a prehistoric ripoff of Ralph and Ed from the Honeymooners, who in turn were loyal raccoons. Lenny and Squiggy, as the book 101 Secrets of the Freemasons reminds us, were in the fraternal order of the Bass on Laverne and Shirley. I appreciate these additional references, Dana, but I was trying not to sound like the oldest man in the world. Too late. Okay, what about Monty Python? In their classic architect sketch, a man who has just presented a plan for a residential tower that's based on his prior experience building slaughterhouses. Uh, the tenants arrive in the entrance hall here, are carried along the corridor on a conveyor belt in extreme comfort and pass murals depicting Mediterranean scenes towards the <laughs> rotating knives. The last 20 feet of the corridor are heavily soundproof. The blood pours down these chutes. <laughs> Excuse me. Hmm? Uh, did you say knives? Uh, rotating knives, yes. <laughs> Are you uh, proposing to slaughter our tenants? Does that not fit in with your plans? <laughs> Abandons his attempt to actually get the job and ends up first decrying and then begging for membership in the Masons that presumably all of the connected businessmen to whom he's presenting his plans belong. Oh, pfft, the abattoir, that's not important. But if one of you could put in a word for me, I'd love to be a Freemason. Freemason, we have doors. I mean, I was, I was a bit on edge just now, but, but if I was a Mason, I'd just sit at the back and not get in anyone's way. Thank you. I've got a second-hand apron. Thank you. Nice. A spry, half-century-old reference. Okay, smartass. For a more contemporary, yet still from our perspective, frighteningly dated animated reference point, remember when Homer joined the Stonecutters? Atlantis off the maps. Who keeps the Martians under wraps? We do, we do. Who holds back the electric car? Timely 26-year-old Simpsons quote Methuselah. Damn you, relentless passage of time. Regardless, as these examples indicate, popular culture in the 20th century reflected the near ubiquity and powerful influence of masonry in American public life. And remember how we mentioned John Dickey's book, The Craft, would be our guide to the Masons? Well, we went straight to the source, and Professor Dickey was kind enough to explore many of the topics we're planning to cover here in a wide-ranging interview, which we'll be interspersing throughout our Masonic discussions. Here he tackles why Masonry was such a force in America historically, reasons for their decline in influence over recent decades, and how that decline has affected their standings in the conspiracy influencer Olympics. Freemasonry really finds its most fertile terrain in America for a whole set of reasons. Americans are great joiners. The American population is very mobile and Freemasonry offers a kind of home from home in the local lodge, a ready-made social life. It's a sort of welfare system, a support system. You know, you, you contribute to Masonry and get back and so on and so forth. And Freemasonry has done an awful lot, if you like, to define and make middle-class American manhood, particularly really since the Civil War. There was almost a sort of golden century of fraternalism. And lots of the other 
brotherhoods, you know, the Moose and the Elk and the Rotary Club are, in effect, versions of the Masonic template. The Masonic fraternity is the mother fraternity of them all with the biggest membership and so on. But it starts to decline uh, and declines very steadily, really, from the 1960s onwards with the growth of the financial industry and of welfare provision with women entering the workforce and, you know, the idea that the man could just get home and have a couple of cocktails and something to eat and then leave, kiss his wife goodbye and go off to the lodge meeting for the evening comes to seem much more difficult to sustain. Young people start to feel a certain sort of distaste that Freemasonry begins to seem a bit stuffy and that the membership starts to age and so on and so forth. So Freemasonry is declining in importance. It's certainly not going to go away. There's still something like a million of them in the United States, more than a million. And, you know, so that's not to be sniffed at, maybe six million around the world. And it's still a very powerful, meaningful force in a lot of people's lives. And we shouldn't discount that. You know, people really take their masonry seriously and it gives a structure and meaning to their lives. Yes, I think it's harder to argue that Freemasons are running the world when you don't have a Freemason as president and haven't had one since Ford. And yes, we've got plenty of other candidates with aliens and whoever else, and paedophiles, whatever else, the Illuminati and the scientists in their dark laboratories or big government. So there are lots of other potential candidates now. They've proliferated while the Freemasons tend to be a bit lower in the mix. I think. That said, outside of the United States, certainly in Italy, in the United Kingdom to a slightly lesser extent, they are still very much thought of as a dirty cabal who were there to take control of the police and the judiciary and promote each other and make sure they aren't punished for any wrongdoing or anything like that as a sort of tool of corruption rather than of thoroughgoing conspiracy. And that's a harder accusation to shake off because it's less obviously paranoid. We would be remiss if we did not, at this point, note that Dickie's book is chock full of fascinating information like this and that you would be a fool not to purchase a copy. Link, of course, in the show notes. So the Masons are in decline, but Dickie's historically sound analysis of the reasons for this decline is not the only opinion out there. Take, for example, the film Terra Masonica, a celebration of three centuries of the craft that saw the filmmaker Tristan Borlard traveling to 80 different Masonic lodges throughout the world to document the varieties of masonry practiced globally today. Rather than focusing on the ways that, for example, the rise of women's rights may have impacted the craft, the film takes the blame the millennials approach that has proved so popular in so many areas over recent years. A major factor in, in the loss in membership is the sociological change of the societies in which we live. Uh, there was a day when there was a great deal of emphasis put on doing something for someone else. We've lost at least two generations of young men uh, simply because the society is more self-centered than what we were at the time of our uh, great uh, numerical numbers within the craft. While that explanation is unsatisfyingly pat, the film has many other merits and we'll be referencing it in the future. For example, it beautifully films the result that shrinking membership roles have had on the upkeep of the grand Masonic structures that were erected during the group's American heyday. This staggering fall in the number of Freemasons is widespread throughout the Western world. Its main consequences is the difficulty in preserving an architectural heritage. In New York, many temples from this time have been abandoned, turned into discotheques or concert halls, or are awaiting a buyer. One of the better music venues in SF is an abandoned Masonic hall called simply the Masonic where FJ, back in 2015, lived a lifelong dream by seeing the replacements during their abortive reunion tour. That show fucking rocked. Thanks for declining, Mason dudes. That's the status of Masonry today. But how did it ever get to that near ubiquitous mid-century peak of influence in American and global life? For that story, we're going to have to jump back to 17th century Scotland. As Dickie writes, 
There was a pre-existing substrate of lore among stonemasons in the British Isles long before any of the structures we'd recognize as proto-Freemasonic were built up. This derives, he notes, from the fact that historically stonemasons had a fairly weak guild system in comparison to other crafts like tanners, carpenters, etc. Stonemasons across Britain made up for the weakness of their guild organization by having an especially rich store of rules, symbols, and myths. Known as the Old Chargers, this mason's law was memorized and handed down by word of mouth. Human memory being the fallible thing that it is, the content of the old charges varied widely, as bits were added and subtracted, garbled and forgotten. Now and again, a version of the old charges would be written down. The first written text to have survived this haphazard process is in verse, making its 826 lines rather easier to memorize. It is famous to Freemasons the world over as the Regius poem. Its provenance and date are uncertain probably Shropshire, maybe 1430. Dickey goes on to note these old charges filter into Masonic history mostly through their creation of a totally mythical, truly ancient origin story for the trade. The story's dramatis personae are plucked from a lucky dip of sources. Ancient Greek intellectuals rub shoulders with some of the big beards from Genesis and the Book of Kings. There are a few personalities who really count here because they would later be integrated into the legends of Freemasonry. One is Hermes Trismegistus, a learned man who, after Noah's flood, rediscovered the geometrical rules of masonry, which pre-flood masons had thoughtfully chiseled into two stone pillars. Euclid, the Greek mathematician, is the next great mason in line because he taught the ancient Egyptians all they knew about stonework, hence the pyramids. Then comes Solomon, who employed 40,000 stonemasons to build his temple, that great summation of Masonic skill and learning. His chief mason was from Tyre. He would be given the name Hiram Abif in later versions of the tale, The same Hiram Abif destined to have a starring role in the Freemasons' third-degree ritual. You'll recall that Hermes Trismegistus is a mythical figure, as is the story of Solomon's Temple, which according to archaeologists was almost certainly not built by the biblical King Solomon. As for Hiram Abif, we'll discuss the weirdly important Masonic significance of that fabricated figure when we get to some of Masonry's secret rituals. see what Dickey explains is a long-standing trait of Freemasonry, both the centrality of history to the group's sense of identity, but also their willingness to simply fabricate that history as needed to support the self-image they prefer. One of the most fascinating things about studying the Freemasons is that they are an organization for whom history is important. The history of their origins, their sense of tradition, When you study the Freemasons, you're studying a lot of narratives about the past, and a lot of them are false trails, if you like, or deceptive. The Freemasons have spent a lot of time kind of doctoring their past. They do it in the same way that a lot of other organizations do, that nations do. Freemasons write history with an agenda. And the agenda tends to be to sort of boost the prestige and esprit de corps of the Freemasons and to give a particular angle on Masonic history. Just to give you an example, the most convincing line back to the origins of the Freemasons that historians have been able to reconstruct, the real one, takes us back to Scotland at the very beginning of the 17th century, to the court of King James VI of Scotland. However, at the beginning of the 18th century, actually more than a century later, English Freemasons who kind of took charge of Freemasonry at that point and kind of refounded it, completely doctored the history and eliminated Scotland from the picture for various uh, political reasons. So it's taken quite a bit of digging to get past that. And the other reason is, of course, that Masonic rituals involve a lot of historical material. Through the centuries, the Freemasons have raided all kinds of religions and periods of history and belief systems in search of symbols for their rituals. 
For example, at the beginning of the 18th century, it was argued that the Templars had had an important role in the origins of Freemasonry. Now, this was completely invented. There was no historical evidence for this. It was really just because the Freemasons liked the idea of having lots of swords and gauntlets and things in their rituals. But of course, they bought into this narrative, which still attracts a lot of people out there trying to link the original Masons to the Templars and so on and so forth. And of course, from the point of view of their enemies, the Catholic Church, for example, has often tried to trace Freemasonry's origins back to the earliest heresies, you know, in the sort of the, like the Manichaeans in the fourth century after Christ. And that's because the Freemasons themselves saw in the Manichaean worldview a source of images. So is this battle, if you like, of false histories. So the old charges provided a powerful, if mythical, history for those who worked as Masons in late feudal period Britain. But as we alluded earlier, it's in King James's Scotland in the early 1600s when the historical origins of Freemasonry begin. Dana, can we get a brief recap on why this Jimmy fellow is so important to our tale? Well, Jesuit, the famous Queen Elizabeth, the alleged Virgin Queen, though Sir Francis Drake, among others, might contest that designation, left no heirs. So because she was the last of the legitimate Tudor line, her cousin James, who was known at that point as James VI, King of Scotland, became James I, King of England and Ireland as well. This was the first unification of the crown to Scotland and England. They would continue to be part of the same country, grudgingly on the Scots' part, down to the present day. Unless there was another referendum since we recorded this, in which case all bets are off. Right. And because James was practically born with a kilt on, he moved the political center of the Unified Kingdoms from London to Edinburgh and set his administration to work building a loyal core of politically connected and prominent Scots to run the country and manhandle the recalcitrant English. One of the guys he hired to this end was William Shaw, a minor nobleman appointed Master of Works, or in the original accent, Master of Work. As Dickey relates, Shaw was, like other intellectuals of his time, Fascinated by the rediscovered classical texts and art that were fueling the Renaissance, he was particularly moved by Vitruvius, a military engineer from the first century BCE, who argued that those who designed buildings must be not only builders, but also intellectuals. In a sense, the rediscovery and spread of his work marked the beginning of the modern discipline of architecture, and William Shaw would become the first person known as an architect in Scotland. Shaw began working to share his elevated view of their craft and its place in the life of the mind with influential master masons, culminating in a meeting in Holyrood Palace in Edinburgh. This meeting would inject some of the most exciting ideas circulating in the Renaissance culture of James VI's court into the medieval law of working stonemasons as embodied in the old charges. The result would be Freemasonry. Shaw's new lodges were deliberately designed as autonomous groups that kept their cards close to the vest. They didn't check in with the local powers that be, and while they kept minutes of their meetings, those were for Masonic eyes only. Even then, they only recorded the nuts and bolts stuff. The secrets of the order were never to be committed to paper. This was all part of the plan, to get well-connected professional artisans to buy into the idea of James as their new King Solomon, and of themselves as a secret society in touch with the most ancient and mystical wisdom. In a sense, flattering the pretensions of people who could help James consolidate his power. It was a powerful pitch. But Shaw went even further, drawing on Renaissance culture to find things that appeal to the stonemasons. He stipulated that all masons and apprentices should be subjected to a trial of the art of memory and science thereof. Here was Shaw's most innovative move. Being a stonemason certainly entailed memorizing a great deal, not least the old charges. Shaw now told the masons gathered about him that they were not just remembering, but practicing the art and science of memory. This was a master stroke. Not only were these Masons now important allies of the king with their own secret society, but in fact, Shaw was effectively telling the Scots stonemasons that they too were hermeticists. Though they had not realized it, they were right at the forefront of humanity's most exalted philosophical endeavor. Hermeticism chimed powerfully with many of the bits and pieces of folklore that were already there in the stonemasons' old charges. Arcane wisdom handed down since time immemorial. A Hermes Trismegistus, the same wise man who, according to the old charges, had found Masonic wisdom engraved on a pillar after the flood. Secret societies devoted to the pursuit of occult truth, great buildings as stores of sacred knowledge, the art of memory, and then, of course, symbols. Symbols everywhere. The energy released by this confluence of the oral craft culture of the medieval stonemasons and the scholarly hermetic strand of Renaissance court culture was electrifying. 
the possibilities it opened up were endless. One consequence was that the Stonemason's Lodge was soon transformed from just an organization to a place that was as much imaginary as real, where Masons could exercise the art of memory together. Or, as he elaborated in our interview, The real origins, very briefly, I think there's a single moment, a single spark, really. In late 16th, early 17th century Scotland, you have stonemasons who have, like stonemasons in a lot of Europe, a kind of folklore of their own. They like to believe that they're very ancient and they go back to the builders of Solomon's Temple and they associate themselves with the classical discipline of geometry. None of that's true, but it brings them prestige. At that particular moment in time in Scotland, an important figure at the court, uh, James Shaw, sought to, as it were, make an alliance with the stonemasons, bring them on board. And what he sought to do as part of that alliance was bring them into certain crucial aspects of Renaissance philosophy, particularly the idea of hermeticism, the idea that the world could be decoded, the meaning of the universe could be decoded through symbols and through memory. There are other ingredients there because it's at this moment that the Masonic Lodge gets created as a kind of theatre of memory. I don't know if you've got the sort of picture in your head of what a Masonic Lodge looks like, but it's basically a little theatre where Masons carry out their rituals and it's got a kind of chessboard floor and various symbolic pieces, I don't know, globes and columns and lights and candles and things that you move around and rearrange for various symbolic purposes. Those symbols, that comes from this sort of disassociation with the Renaissance discipline of Hermeticism. Shaw died in 1602, just a few years into his effort to transform Scottish masonry into a political force. But his network lived on. Dickey notes that by 1710, there were around 30 lodges in Scotland, while no English lodges can be traced back before 1716. More impressively, 80 plus percent of those Scottish lodges still exist. They're the oldest in the world, boasting four centuries of unbroken history. And over the first of those centuries, the elevated air of mystery that was Shaw's gift to the Masons began to attract gentlemen, in addition to the common workmen who were the original members. Still, Scottish Masonry remained closely connected to the needs and concerns of working stonemasons. It wasn't until English lodges achieved primacy that Freemasonry, the version divorced in all but language and trappings from the discipline of stone cutting, would come into full focus. 